For our text this morning, we'll read Matthew 16, verses 24 through 26. Then said Jesus unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, and whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? This morning we'll consider these words, these three verses in reverse order. We look at verse 26 first, though it's worth mentioning that verse 27 speaks of Christ's return to give according to our works. So he, he, Jesus is coming and he will hold us accountable for how we responded to his word. So verse 26, as a conclusion to what Jesus had just said that we just read this morning, he poses a couple of sobering uh, rhetorical questions. A rhetorical question needs no answer. And the questions were, for what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Or we can say, what good would it do for a person to gain the whole world? To, that is to have power or financial power, fi financial control over the entire world system, to gain so much money and power, wealth, to have uh, uh, control of this entire world, which is under Satan's control currently. He's the head, prince of and the power of the air. But at the consequences of losing his or her own soul, meaning to lose eternal life, eternal life with God. What good would it do? Another way to say this, which maybe is a little more um, plain and direct, what in this world is worth so much to you that you are willing to end up in hell for? The reality is that every person, we know this, will at some point die. It is appointed unto man wants to die. And then the judgment, the Bible says. So we all have an appointment with death, and we cannot avoid it. We will meet that appointment, appointment. unless the rapture takes place and we're ready, then we'll go up and, uh, and conquer death by being translated, transformed, caught up in the air. But we do have an appointment with death. Even the most powerful or the more, most wealthy. James, in our scripture reading we read, uh, James said that life is but a vapor. It appears for a brief time and then evaporates. It, it disappears. It vanishes away. And if we have not taken care to save ourselves in the sense, make uh, provision, uh, prepare for eternity, everything that we gain down here is worthless. If we gain the whole world and lose our soul, we lose everything. Ma many people in this world spend all of their energy to pursue pleasures, possessions, power or position and at the end they find out in the scope of, uh, scope of eternity that it's all worthless. All this stuff is only temporary and we cannot exchange it for eternal life. So we go now to verse 25. Jesus says, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever will lose his life for my sake, that's a key, for Christ's sake, shall find it. The Christian life is a paradox, isn't it? 
To attempt to keep your life means only to lose it. A person who saves his life in order to satisfy his own desires or her own desires uh, or goals apart from God. A person that preserves control of their own life so they can do what they want at the expense of a relationship with Christ ultimately loses eternity, life and eternity with God. By contrast, those who willingly, that's a key too, willingly, self-denial, we'll talk about that. Those who willingly give up their own lives for the sake of Christ actually find true life. If we are willing to put our personal desires, uh, when Jesus says here, whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it. If we are willingly and willing to put personal desires and even life itself unto, in, in God's hands, in his control, understanding that nothing this world has to offer is worth eternity, we will find uh, the blessings of God. We will find eternal life. We, will, we, we may lose or give up this life, and we'll, we consider self-denial. We deny self. We say no to self. But really, we find out very quickly that when we deny ourselves for Christ's sake, we actually, I mean, do we really deny ourselves when we realize what we gain? We're doing ourselves a favor by de de denying ourselves something temporary down here for the sake of eternal life. We actually get this concept very well in a lot of parts of our lives, don't we? People that want to lose uh, weight w or athletes will deny themselves food or the time doing other things to exercise, to eat properly. We, know, we understand businessmen, businesswomen, uh, career men, career women, they understand that in order to climb up to the top of the ladder, I must deny myself. I heard somebody say that a, a religion that costs me nothing is worth nothing. Think about that. Jesus is saying that here in this text. So, Jim Elliot, the Christian missionary who was actually murdered by the very people he was trying to reach out to, said he is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Philip Henry, the father of the famous preacher and uh, Bible commentator, Matthew Henry, was credited with some, a similar saying. Uh, he said, he is no fool who parts with that which we cannot keep when he is sure to be recompensed with that which he cannot lose. Jesus spoke earlier in, in, in the book of, uh, in the Gospel of Matthew of laying our treasures in heaven where thieves don't break through and steal. Moth doesn't corrupt. These things will wear out. Uh, your wealth will disappear. But the treasures we lay in heaven, they will endure forever. So Jesus invites us to uh, lose our lives in the sense to give up uh, the right to our own life and control, submit to him for the sake of, deny sin and self-satisfaction, self-preservation, and turn to God for help, for salvation, for guidance, for eternal life. So Jesus says, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. He that holds on with, to his own life, looking inwardly, pursuing physical comforts and pleasures at the expense. There's nothing wrong with enjoying things that God has blessed us with. But if they come at the expense of the will of God, the known will of God, if they come at the expense of our own conscience that speaks to us, it's a God-given gift, our conscience, that says, you really shouldn't be doing this. And if we uh, indulge or, uh, or partake in an activity that is unlawful according to God's word, so if we uh, expend our life and energy to pursue our own desires at the expense of God's will, we will lose our soul. On the other hand, those that lose 
their life for Christ's sake will find it. If we are willing to risk, willing to even give up our life, if that's what God calls, for his sake, for the gospel's sake, we find eternal life. This is not light reading. <laughs> are you with me this morning? Yes. But it is bl- a blessing to understand the key. The key to experiencing the blessings of God in our lives. According to Jesus, according to our text, spiritual gain comes through loss. It is, this is completely opposite of what the world promotes, uh, the men- mentality of our world. If we are willing to suffer or endure whatever God appoints in our lives, and we're not trying to, ba- uh, we never want to inflict or pursue pain or suffering. No, no, no. I, would, I want to avoid it at all costs. But if God appoints it, whatever the difficulty is, even political persecution, even suffering, which none of us, even illness, it's easy to say those words. It's easy to sing the song, I surrender some. I mean, I surrender all. We can say those words and they fall, flow out, out of our mouth very easily. But when God corners us up, puts his finger on something in our lives, are you willing to surrender this? For the kingdom of God's sake? That's another story. So, true spiritual gain comes through loss. He that will lose his life shall find it. Lose his life for my sake shall find it, Christ says. He who places the utmost value. You know, we all have priorities and values, right? But the the one that places the utmost value in in, in eternity and their soul uh, that is eternal and places Christ at the center of their lives, willing to give up whatever hinders us from serving God, we will find life, eternal life. So now we go back to verse 24, and he, where Jesus says, if any man will come after me. What does that mean, to come after Christ? He also says, follow me, at the end of that verse. Uh, this, these words, if any man will come after me or follow me, when Jesus said this, in fact, one of the songs this morning was, uh, Jesus said, follow me. He told, he, when the fishermen were doing, or the, the, those that would become his disciples, Jesus passed by and he said, follow me and I will make you a fi- a fishers of men. That, uh, ex- those words uh, speak of the call to discipleship. The call to be a disciple. The call to be a Christian. To, to be a follower, a disciple, a student, a disciple is a learner or a student uh, uh, of the master, of the rabbi. A disciple is someone who is passionate about learning and following the teachings of the rabbi or the master or the teacher. That's what I mean. To be a Christian is to be Christ-like. But the goal of discipleship in, the first, cent- in f- first century Judaism, and it still applies to us, the goal of being a disciple was not only to learn what the master knew or what he taught, but to possess the piety or the righteousness, the holiness of the, the, the rabbi. To be, not just to know what the rabbi uh, knows, but to be like him, to be like Jesus. So we are called to discipleship. It's a universal call. It, uh, everyone's invited To follow Jesus. So when Jesus said these words, come after me or follow me, whether it's to Simon, to Andrew, to Peter, to John, to any of the disciples, and when he says this to us, he's saying, embrace the call of discipleship. Be my disciple. Learn of me. Learn all my doctrines and teachings, my commandments. Submit to my authority to follow me or to be my disciple. Uh, In spite of the opposition or the challenges, 
Observe my example, my speech, my behavior, and emulate it. That's what it means to be a disciple. In other words, live like me, be like me, be holy and harmless like I am, is what Jesus says. So here in our text, in verse 24, Jesus lays out the price of discipleship. What will it cost you? You know, this is, these are some of the most significant words of Jesus, but they're not the most popular. <laughs> they're not. Who wants to hear about self-denial and taking up your cross? Who wants to uh, hear about giving up your rights and submitting to somebody else? It is not what our society teaches. So it's not popular, but, but Jesus said, if any man wants to be my disciple, or if any man, any person, any woman, any young person wants to be a, a Christian, a true Christian, Jesus said, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So he, he is describing here, the nature of discipleship and the price. It does cost. You know, let him deny himself, Jesus says, for Christ's sake. It is initiated by self. This is the aspect of God's call. It's not initiated by your parents or the youth pastor, or the church. That is not what Christ is calling us to, to follow what the church says, or follow what my parents say. But self-denial, it begins with me because I want Christ, because I want eternal life. It means something. I always, I've said this many a, t a times as a preacher, the, the word cuts this way first. It does. It does. It means something to actually say no to self. It really does. As parents, sometimes we may say no to our children, right? For their own good, for their own benefit. We may establish boundaries and even enforce them um, for their own benefit. We had some, uh, uh, some family members last week in, in town with little, little ones, and I heard their mother said to one of them, I won't say his name, but uh, she said to one of them, son, you're really begging for some boundaries right now. And actually, children crave boundaries. They push the limits because they don't know when to stop. They don't know when they're crossing into dangerous area, dangerous territory. So as parents, we establish boundaries. Though I suppose there are parents that don't say no to their children. What does that produce? Self-centered, spoiled, entitled children. But you know the sad part is? Those kind of children can grow up and become self-centered, entitled, entitled adults. When they don't learn that there's boundaries. But you know, as parents, there comes a point where the, it's not the parents' role anymore to establish and enforce boundaries. Right? There comes a point where each adult, you know, I, I hear this, I'm an adult now. <laughs> I get to make my own decision. That's true. And at best, as parents, then we can prescribe, offer boundaries, and suggest boundaries. Actually, this is all that God does. He offers boundaries. They exist, but it's self-initiated, self-denial. We de decide if we're going to honor the boundaries that produce eternal life. Self-denial and dependence on God is in direct opposition to carnality, that sin nature that we're born with. Our flesh, that sinful nature that we're born with, cries out, fights against self-denial. Give me, feed me, make me feel good. Give me what I want. That's what the flesh says. So self-denial, it, it comes at, completely against the carnal nature and the world's mentality, which is self-indulgence and self-sufficiency. Self-sufficiency is to, uh, to have the mentality, I don't need God. I'm good and I'm fine without God. So to practice self-denial is to acknowledge that I am not uh, 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 able to live this life without Christ. 
I need him to direct me. Jesus taught that there are two paths on earth that human beings can take. Only two. Two ways. The broad way and the narrow way. The broad way is very popular. Very trendy. Anything goes on the broad way. Indulge yourself in whatever you want. Whatever the body craves, there are no boundaries. Actually, the only boundary is that there's no boundaries. When you start telling me there's a boundary, that's when you're crossing the line. That's what the Broadway teaches, isn't it? Anything sinful, evil is permitted and encouraged on the Broadway. Immorality, filth, worldly lusts are fine, are promoted. Greed, covetousness, lying to your parents is okay on the Broadway. Stealing from your employers. It's okay. Fornication. Adultery is okay on the Broadway. It's, the, it's normalized. Pornography is normalized. Adult, adultery is sanitized. You don't want to call it adultery because that speaks of sin and consequence to God. So let's call it an affair. So you sanitize the spiritual aspect or the consequences. That's what the Broadway does. But the sobering reality of The mentality of the Broadway is it leads to eternal destruction. There's an acronym I heard recently that young people use today, especially on social media. The acronym is YOLO, which is short for you only live once. YOLO means to recklessly pursue things that are enjoyable and exciting while throwing long-term consequences to the wind. Do all you, just YOLO, you know, do all you can to pursue earthly pleasures, whatever feels good, whatever is even edgy or a little dangerous. Just, you only live once without concern for the consequences, uh, eternal, oh, excuse me, uh, long-term consequences on earth. But uh, this is the Broadway mentality that, that actually not only dealing with consequences, there are consequences for our actions on earth oftentimes, what we sow we will reap, but ultimately neglecting or ignoring that there are eternal consequences. But there is another path Jesus offers and says that we can choose one of two paths. The narrow way is not very popular, is more restrictive. But it's the narrow way, it's through Christ, not any way to find eternal life, but it's through Christ. It's through self-denial. It's through surrender to God. It's through a life of dependence on God that we find eternal life. It is, the narrow way is holy living, clean living. It is right living, righteous living, but it produces love, joy, peace, trust, fellowship with God, trust with our fellow man. It adds no sorrow. Uh, the sins, uh, the pleasures of sin are for a season, the Bible says. There's some pleasure in the things of this world, but, but, but there's also great sorrow that comes with it. But with God's way, there's no sorrow. When Jesus said, if any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross. When Jesus used this picture that his own followers, we are followers of Christ. We are to take up our cross. When his disciples heard that description, that picture, that his followers are supposed to take up their crosses and follow, the disciples knew exactly what Jesus meant. Crucifixion crucifixion was a common uh, Roman method of execution. Condemned criminals had to carry their own cross through town. To their, to their destination, to the place of execution. So if you saw somebody walking through town, carrying their own cross, you knew that they were not coming back. This was it for them. So Jesus says, if you want to be a Christian, a disciple, you need to take, deny yourself and take up your cross and carry it to your destination where you crucify yourself. We're not talking about physical, though God may sometimes call people to actually give their lives for Christ. But there's a spiritual crucifixion that we are called to. This meant commitment to Jesus, to what he taught even unto death, to not compromise on truth, on the things of God, on his commandments, all the way to the end. 
This is what it meant to be a disciple. Once you were nailed to the cross, there's no turning back. We sing that song, I have decided to follow Jesus, which means I have decided to be a Christian, or I have decided to be a disciple. No turning back. When you're nailed to the cross, you're not going to, getting off that cross anymore. That means you're going to die on that cross. And Jesus says, let him take up his cross. Death to self, meaning to our own way and submission to Christ. This is the answer to finding life. You might hear us talk around here about surrender. Well, Jesus talked about surrender. Or self-denial. Why? Uh, or losing our lives. Why? Which represents consecration. It is because the, it's the key to receiving from God. We have to deny our own way to die to self, to d- die to our own desires and say, you are God, you are Lord of my life now. I yield my rights to you. A man that's on the cross does not have any rights. He doesn't demand anything. He's there. How often, even as Christians, we can feel like our rights are violated. May the Lord help us to remember that we have willingly given our lives to Christ. Paul said this, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life that now I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I, I, I've been crucified with Christ. I've experienced a spiritual death and revival or renewal. I died to sin. I died to the world. In fact, to, to take up our cross also means die, death to the world. The system, uh, evil system, wicked system that is anti-God. Paul also said in Galatians 6, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me and I unto the world. The world is crucified to me. The world, when somebody is dead, that means spiritually dead, that means they're not responsive to the, the, their environment. When we are dead to this world, dead to sin, it has no effect on us. We, uh, when we have died to sin and to the world, uh, we live unto Christ. We're sensitive to the Spirit of God. Christ lives in us. He guides us. He leads us. One other note, speaking of being on the cross, crucified with Christ. I read a story a number of years ago of some young men, fresh out of seminary. And they heard a famous missionary was in town famous preacher, and they wanted to come and see him. They traveled to this town so they could hear this preacher. And the preacher, this, uh, sem- uh, this famous missionary that won many souls to Christ, he preaches this simple sermon. And at the en- conclusion of the sermon, the two young men are talking to each other, and they, they were not impressed. Well, you know, we expected something more. They were looking for some impressive display of expository excellence. And they didn't understand this simple message to take up your cross and follow Christ. And a little old lady behind them heard them. And she says to them, boys, a man that is on the cross doesn't have to say very much. Think about that. You've already said it. Are you crucified with Christ? Christ. Words are cheap for all of us. We can say the right words. And Christ says, I want you to be a real disciple that will make heaven because I'm coming back for a bride that is pure. And you know the beauty about our God? He just waits patiently. While we're, we're sleeping spiritually or while we're uh, uh, doing one, saying one thing and doing another, putting God off. He waits. He beckons. He gently calls us. Consistently he calls us. Consistently he speaks to our conscience. Will you make me first in your life? But then he waits. 
So it needs to be self-initiated. We pray that by the grace of God, we will all respond today by remembering, being reminded of the price of discipleship, but that we will initiate, with the Lord's help, the new decision say, Lord, I have decided to follow you, or I want to purpose to be more like you want me to be. I want to be crucified with Christ, no more living my own way, but I want to truly live a life surrendered unto you, because that's where the blessing comes. When I give control to you, that's when I receive the treasures of heaven.